All right, let's get started. Uh, welcome everyone, happy Thursday. Hope everyone is doing well. Um, today we have Dennis Cusick and myself will be moderating this. We're gonna start with uh, the stats that Dennis pulled from the Tuesday meeting. They were super helpful. We got a lot of great feedback on that. So I thought we'd just have a little deeper dive on that for 10 minutes, which is gonna really set us up nicely for uh, the agents on our panel. Uh, which we are going to talk about best strategies, best strategies that are working uh, during these times. Uh, so without further ado, hey, Dennis. Um, hey there. Let's, let's talk a little about, um, you know, what you found in general and, and what surprised you and what didn't. Um, well, first of all, let me, uh, I'm going to pull up my screen in a minute for sure. those of you that weren't on the, um, that weren't on the call yesterday. Basically what we did was we, went back and looked at the ACRIS closings since the beginning of COVID, since March, right? And, and we only looked at deals where the contract was signed after March and it was ACRIS closed. So we know these numbers are good. Just like you were, like if you were doing comps, you wouldn't use stuff that wasn't, wasn't ACRIS verified. You'd only use ACRIS verified stuff. So all this data and we're gonna talk about you know, points to a market that is under, uh, you know, it, under 2 million, as you'll see. And, and why is that important? Well, you know, what do you want? What you, you want to, you want to have buyers in the right price point and you want to have, you know, try and have properties that are in the, in the right, in the right bucket. Right. So let's talk about this. Let me um, pull up my screen and hopefully I won't have the same problem. Alex, I had the same, this is doing the same thing. It's going to did, it did yesterday. Sure. Yeah. So I'm going to send it to you. you know, let, I, can okay. I got it. Dennis. I you can got it. it. Why don't you pull it up? Yep. There we go again. It's, I, I know I fixed it so I, and it did it again. So go figure. Okay. Um, but we can, just, we can start by just talking about what the average price is. I mean, we, you know, at this time last year, the average price was about a million eight in Manhattan and about seven, about 750 in Brooklyn and about, excuse me, about 950 in, in, in Brooklyn. And Dennis, when you pull those numbers, you're including resales and new development? Yeah, That's yeah I, I know. I separated them out. So in this case, see, you see that number? We're going to go down a little bit to the next slide. Uh, sure. We're going to go all the way where it says ACRIS closings. Um, for, uh, Rian. Keep going, keep going, keep going. There you go. Right there, right there, right there. So that average last year in Manhattan was a million, a million eight at this time. So if you look at that number, you're like, wow, we're way down. That means prices are down. That's not, that's not necessarily true because when we look at the unit mix and we look at the price points, there's so many smaller deals, it's pulling the average down. So if we go to the next slide, uh, let's look at the unit mix. Look at how many of those deals in Manhattan are studios and one bedrooms and, the, and, and, and twos. There's, that number is really, really high. If you go to the next slide, and oh, I'm sorry, could you go back up once? I'm sorry. If you also look at the median and the average prices next to studio and next to one bedroom, look, those numbers aren't that far off, which means the negotiability is, is, is it, all the deals are like right there. And then if you go down to the bigger apartments, you notice the delta, the delta is much, much, much larger because there's, there's just a big varying there's a big difference in the types of property and so on and so forth. Some are ultra lux, some might be just regular cookie cutter apartments. So uh, going down to Brooklyn, same thing. The market is 56% are studio and one bedrooms. A lot of first time buyers. That's what, we, that's what we're all hearing. We're hearing a lot of first time buyers that are taking care, you know, taking advantage of the low interest rates and they know it's a good market to buy in. So they're out in force. And, and they're local buyers, we're finding a lot, you know, our, where our, our Pieta Terra buyers aren't here, you know, they're just not. Uh, scroll down to the next slide. Uh, properties, uh, the only thing that stuck out at, at me here, like Alex said, is like what's, that condo price is normally a lot higher. That, that condo price is normally 2.5, 2.6 average, and we're down to 1.9. But again, unit mix, a unit mix and, uh, and smaller apartments. Dennis, do you also think that maybe there's, I don't know if this is true or not, is there less new development deals that's bringing down the number? 
Um, in this case, these are these are all resale numbers, and I, I mean, resale now. okay, they're okay. all resale numbers, and and the, 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 and uh, we'll talk. We can talk about the new dev stuff separately. Sure. Can you get the next one? Thanks. Same thing here. Uh, I mean, fifty. Per, oh, actually, this is actually was interesting. Normally, normally the property types in Brooklyn are split like a third, a third, a third. You know, uh, 33, 33, 33, that townhouse number is high, which kind of makes sense when you think about it, uh, because people want outdoor space, you know, people want more of a suburban feel, and that's what Brooklyn offers. And townhouses in Brooklyn offer. So this is, you, you talk about, uh, Alex, what surprised me, this surprised me. Right. I, was, I was really surprised that, that it was only 6%. Right. You know? Um, the, the last the, off the original ask um, was 9%. Um, and then I looked at it, we also looked at it where if it was a listing that was only listed after March, in other words, we're already in COVID, we already had the lockdown. And if you looked at those listings, they were also only 6% off the last ask average. And that original last number just dropped down a point, which just means people were pricing things better, right? Because they Dennis, it, it makes me think of a really good point for the people on the call for all your sellers who are afraid to sell because they're fearing it's 20% negotiability. This is a really great st statistic to share with them. Yeah, and I and I also I can I can also share because I have all these in, in a spreadsheet. I mean and with all the discounts. And, and I looked at, I, I even went as far as uh, to look at all the deals that had like over 30% discount to see if any of these jumped out at me. And they were the kind of deals that would have had a 30% discount in a good market. You know what I mean? They're, one of them was on for two years. This is a, there was something, I think it was 1125 Park. They were asking 5 million. It, it was a combination that needed a gut and they ended up trading for two or something like that. Um, and then there were other deals, the big deals with the really, really big discounts. I mean, like, like significant multi-million dollar discounts. Most of the properties were for, were with condos that people bought it, you know, three, four years ago and paid paid twenty million. They they listed it for eighteen and they took fourteen or fifteen or whatever. And which basically, who are those people? Those are the people that can afford to just write it off, right? It's not, it's not everybody that's going to do that. But again, what Alex said about the 6%, I think you got, I mean, we all have to keep that into our head. Everybody wants to negotiate. You're going to see on one of the sides, 75% of the deals are negotiated. you got to build your six, you, you know, it, you're going to have to negotiate at least 6% on average. Next slide. Uh, so this is what I was, I'm sorry, it was, I, knew, I knew I was going to say that. Above S, 75% of the deals were negotiated, um, of the ones that closed. 21% uh, were at ask, and who said you can't uh, have a bidding war anymore? Uh, they still exist, but they, guess, look at where they are, though. Look at the average price of the deals that went above ask. They were all, the average price was a million. So, you know, that's where the market is. That's where the, the activity and that's where the most buyers are. At least that's where they have been up to this point, I should say. And then in, in, in discounts by area, the, the, the lower the average price, it seems, the, 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 the less the discount. And so Upper Manhattan, up, and Upper Manhattan being anything above 96th Street, you know, 3% on average, whereas down here in Tribeca where I am, Every, what's the average price? 4.6. <laughs> so then they look at the discount, 9%. So, so we know that the, higher, that the higher the price, the bigger the discount a, on average. But then again, we have, we're looking at 16 deals in, tri, in, in Tribeca. This one strikes me as I would never have thought Tribeca would have led the neighborhood category at 9% discount. Um, I'm surprised to see Midtown East only at five, but it must be the lower price point. Uh, and even if we go down to Financial District Battery Park, again, only 5%. Two areas that are notoriously slow during these times, but the negotiability is holding up compared to the more expensive properties. So really great um, information here to use with your buyers and sellers. Yeah, in Brooklyn, six and eight. So. 
Um, not, I mean, we all know that there's more activity in Brooklyn. I mean, if you talk to any, any, I mean, at least the, my experience with talking to all the agents that I work with is that, at, that Brooklyn, there's a lot more velocity. There's more showings on their Brooklyn properties than there are on their Manhattan properties. But negotiability is the same. Same thing about here is about 75, 70, 75% were, nego were negotiated. Um, but the splits were different. It's just like about the average prices are the same. And that's that's it, Alex. I mean, in terms of the numbers, so what right. did we learn. We, we learned that it's six percent on average. The sky is not falling. The price. I mean, our price is softer. Absolutely. Everyone wants to negotiate. Absolutely. But it's not like everybody slash and burn and run. It's not that market. Great, thank you very much, Dennis. Um, so let's uh, let's introduce the agents who are gonna be on our panel. Uh, we have Lauren Chow, who I know is gonna be joining us in a few minutes. Uh, Jordan Hawk and Wesley Stanton, a team. Uh, Sean Wilson and Greg Meyer, welcome everyone. And uh, let's get right to it. Um, I'm just gonna ask you guys some questions and uh, we can, if, you, if you're compelled to speak up, you can. I'll just go around and ask each of you these questions. Uh, are you reaching out more, less, or the same during this period? And the reason I ask this is, you know, in April and May, we definitely were being sensitive to uh, how we were communicating. It's September now, but we're still in COVID times. How do you reach out? What does the conversation sound like? Um, Greg, since you're right next to me, I'm going to start with you. <laughs> uh, I, I would say I'm definitely reaching out more, especially to the appropriate parties I know would have been most impacted by the pandemic or those that are hot leads that I've been speaking to before the pandemic. I mean, during the lockdown when the pandemic was heightened, I was far more concentrated on checking in on people just to see how they were doing generally. And now I think my focus is... Uh, is just follow up uh, because consistent follow up is really what generates the most business for me. Right, right. So you didn't you didn't necessarily uh, tone down your messaging. You just continued. Maybe maybe you did, but you continued communication during this period. Well, yeah. I mean, certainly um, the the message and and the, the the feeling of that communication was a lot different when we were all freaking out, you know, and um, when we were all uh, on house arrest and, you know, we weren't even showing. Uh, but now that I think the numbers have leveled out, now that there's some more normalcy out there in the world, and now that we have an actual real market, uh, yeah. I think my communication now is, is a combination of, of, of business and personal, but it's, it's definitely gravitating more towards the business side of things now than it would have been then for sure. Sure, sure. Sean, what? It, how about you? What? What's your? Uh, what's the communication been like? And um, has it been more? Has it been less? Has it been different? Has it changed in those six months? Uh, Sean, you have to un unmute yourself. Bottom left corner. There Hello. you go. Hi, Sean. Hi, hi, Alex. Well, thank you for having me, Alex. It's awesome to be here speaking. Uh, but I will say that our team structure is a little different because um, not everyone's on the phone. So Martin really spends two hours a day calling people his sphere of influence, and he does that religiously. He blocks out the time. I do hear those conversations. So I will say during COVID, his coach was like, get on the phone, simply reach out to people and see how they're doing. Now those phone calls have shifted more to sharing information. People wanna know what's going on in the market. So this is an absolutely great time to tell them what you're seeing, what you're experiencing, and simply just to check in to see how they're doing. So I would say definitely reaching out more. Also, Whit Proudy's on our team and Whit spends two hours a day calling expired leads. Now we took a break for that during COVID, but now he's on that and he's being extremely successful calling people uh, with expired. And then Alex, who's on our team also, Alex is more of a, um, he's more of a social sort of social networker. So he does a lot of his on Instagram, Facebook, but he says he's reaching out to people more now than he was before. So I would actually say overall, the team is reaching out more definitely than we were prior to COVID. 
Got it. Makes sense. Um, Jordan and Wesley, you guys are a team and, and you're, I'll let either you go first and, and share and we'll, we'll work it out. <laughs> Jordan, you want to go? You want me to go? All right, I'll go. Um, you know, when the pandemic started, you know, I, I, Jordan and I made a concerted effort to, to call every one of our clients, really just not business related, although the conversation might have gone there, but just to kind of make sure they're okay, let them know we're here from them if they need anything. Um, but we, you know, we try and reach out our, to every one of our past clients or sphere three to every three to six months anyway. Um, I'm just going to quickly ask, do you do phone calls? Do you do texts? Do you do emails? I, I'm a big proponent that if you're not on the phone talking to somebody, it's not really an effective mm. phone call. Mm -hmm. um, I'm old school like that. I, 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 I prefer to use text for quick things, not for actual conversations. Um, so, you know, I, 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 I reached out with a phone call to every single one of my clients, which was a monumental effort. And frankly, we had the time. So, uh, but it was really more of just, how are you doing? Can we help? Is there anything we can do? And, you know, maybe it went to a market related question, maybe not. Um, and then, you know, you know, we, it kind of just leveled out to kind of a little more what we do normally. Obviously some of those clients from those phone calls turned into more consistent calls, but I certainly wasn't going to spam somebody and call them every week or anything like that. Sure. Sure. But it paid off. I mean, you know, like obviously, you know, reaching out to those, those, those people, um, even if it's just to say, Hey, um, you know, it just keeps you on their radar. And when they need something, they'll, they'll remember to call you. Do you and Jordan, um, and Jordan, feel free to answer this. Uh, Sean bring, brought up an interesting point about his team and how different people do different things and they isolate two hours just to reach out. Do you guys do something like that? I do. I do. It's, it's so important. I mean, Tom Ferry calls it the hour of power. And um, I, don't, I don't think I was doing it last, I know I wasn't doing it last year. It's just like when times get tough, you better take it a step, <laughs> not a notch up. Otherwise, you're going to drown with the rest of them. And, um, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm in no interest in drowning anytime soon. And actually, Wes and I, we had, a, like we had an amazing summer because we had lined up all that stuff. You know, being on the street sometimes takes away your time away from, you know, getting on the phone and, and you get, you know, when you have all these emails coming in and it was kind of quiet, you know, so, so we got on the phone and it, and it paid off. How long do you think, like if you say, I started this communication six months ago, 12 months ago, 18 months ago, how long do you guys think it takes to um, get to the point where you pick up the phone and it's just so natural? Like, do you know what I mean? Like, how, how long? I think it. I think if you're not doing it consistently, it's always going to feel a little unnatural. But it, it depends on who you're calling, right? If you're cold calling somebody, you know, even now, and and Jordan and I built our business based on cold calling, so we've done it a lot. We know how to do it. We're good at it. But if you haven't done it for six months, that first, second, third phone call, you know, it's gonna it's gonna feel you know, awkward because it's, it's kind of a grind, honestly. I, I don't know anyone who like gets up in the morning loving cold calling. You know, when you're calling people, you know, yes, it's easy. It's just yeah. like if calling love, a friend. Hey, right, if, you know if you love cold calling, it means you have no friends. Yeah. <laughs> if you love cold calling, call me. Come, if you love cold calling, call Jordan and me. We will hire you. <laughs> That's right. That's right. right. <laughs> Everyone on the call, you can call Jordan and Wesley from three to five today. <laughs> yes. You're hired. Hired. <laughs> Done. Done. Uh, um, we're going to move My on. advice, though, my, my advice is to start with calling is to call the warm leads first. Call the people. Call. Start warm. Start with people that you know that, you know, people that are going to be more receptive to a phone call to build up your confidence and then work your way into the colder calls. That's a great point, Sean. It's, it's like playing to your strengths. Robert Refkin always says that, you know, play to your strengths, don't play to your weaknesses. Um, so in the same way, play to your strengths in your, in your uh, sphere of influence. And, and, uh, we did, and uh, take small bites. You don't like, you know, uh, five, five, five calls a day, five strangers, five lead follow-ups, you know, like small, small groups so you don't overwhelm yourself and, you know. Sure. 
because it's but a I have a, I have, yeah, I have a slogan. If you want to stand out, reach out. So we tell people, call. If you want to stand out, reach out. It's simple. I like yeah, it. You can you cannot sell anything over an email or a text message. It's impossible. If you want to sell something, if you want to accomplish something, you have to pick up the phone, and you will be ten times more successful. There's no question about it. Well, there, I think it's a, a convincing uh, endorsement for picking up the phone. Um, so let's move on to the next question. And uh, Lauren, I think I just saw that you joined. So welcome. And uh, I'll let you get settled in. Uh, are you guys focused on specific markets? Um, are you paying attention to the trends? Just like what Dennis had shared, these markets, these, these where the deals are happening. Do you refocus your strategies based on that? 90% of the deals are happening under 2 million. Um, or do you just do what you're doing? You reach out to your database, you reach out to your sphere of influence and whatever comes, comes and that's what you do. Um, uh, let's go in reverse. Uh, Jordan, Wesley, why don't we start with you guys? Wes, I would say oh, Jordan. this yeah. market, buyers are where it's at. I, I, you know, for years you always wanted the listing yeah. But I don't, I don't know if I want the listing anymore. You know, I want, I, I don't want, I, you know, they're, you know, it's fun to be with a buyer, right? It's fun to get a great deal and take apart someone else. It's <laughs> fun when they're taking you apart, you know? And so, um, so I think Wes and I have definitely shifted our strategy to more buyer side deals. Um, certainly I'm on the street more than I've ever been in years and it's a lot more work, but I think that's where the money's at rat right now. Jordan. Sure. Can I ask you, how, so how are you shifting towards more buyers? I see you pitching less. What do you, are you, you know what I mean? Like, so how do you, how do you steer more towards buyers? How do you, well, you, know, you know, Street Easy has their program and it, and it, you know, it costs you a good amount of money to, to engage in that program. You know, they're taking a, a huge referral fee out of uh, those buy side leads. And, and maybe a year ago, I would have turned my nose up at that, but uh but today it's, you know, it's a spigot, you know, and especially when you have, when you do as many transactions, Wes and I do, you have a lot of access to a lot of the buildings. So um, that's, I think that's my, my main, that's how I appreciate it the most. You know, another thing is obviously those direct buyers that come to your listings are that much more important to follow up with. You know, when you're, when you're really, really busy, sometimes the follow up falls by the wayside or you can't follow up in time and it, you know, but it's very important to, you know, maximize your opportunities because right now being with a serious buyer is almost easy. Um, you know, there's a lot of opportunities for them and they're negotiating great deals. So who wouldn't want to buy right now? Um, sellers, on the other hand, it's very challenging, very challenging because there's not that many buyers. Um, so you really have to, you really have to give yourself, you know, you have to expand your sphere as much as possible. And as Jordan said, you know, even if that means giving up referral fees, whether that's just street easy or agents out of the city or, you know, whatever, um, it's just important to have that deal flow because deals lead to more deals. You either that, that's somebody referring you or, you know, or, or meeting an open house buyer or whatever. Right. Right. Lauren, Welcome. Lauren was out showing as a busy agent. She joined us a little late, but jumped right in. I appreciate you showing up. Um, what are you, how is your business uh, focused? Are, are you focused on what's going on with the buyers and sellers or, or are you just working you know, your sphere of influence as it comes to you? Uh, you have to unmute yourself, Lauren. <laughs> Bottom left. Hi. Okay. Got it. <laughs> um, yeah. I'm actually at one of my listings in Chelsea. Um, the buyer actually flew in from California. We're in contract and he hadn't seen it before. But um, this is a listing that's an example of a former agent who referred me to listing. Um, I, I, you're answering your question. It's the latter. Um, all of my business, I would say, is referral based. So whether it's in Manhattan or New York or $400,000 or $4 million, I'm going to treat it the same. And I think sure. it's, all the, it's all the time that I've invested over the past couple of years, um, sure. why I've been able to keep in touch with people. Um, right. I, I feel like I have been guilty of yeah, not making my three to five phone calls a day, new people, because I'm just trying to keep afloat. Um, but like many of us, I think we're just like running laps <laughs> trying to, you know, service our clients at this point. But I, I love working with buyers. I think I totally agree that 
I rather work with maybe three buyers than you know having a sales listing. Lauren, thanks for sharing about how hard it is to make the calls. For those of you who don't know, I was an agent for 20 years and um, my goal one year and it, it became my best year was five calls every day. It's 25 a week, 100 a month, 1200 in a year. And let me just tell you that works and it's really hard work. <laughs> it's hard work yeah. because yeah. you get pulled in different directions. And uh, I, that, that's I have it. Yeah, I've been trying to make a more concerted effort with CRM. I know I'm way behind on getting that organized, but even just having a one-on-one -on -one with Vince Stone the other day helped me send out a couple, you know, quick touch base emails that I, I think definitely makes a huge difference. Sure, sure. Sean, what do you got for us? I would say uh, to d diversify, to like really have just run the gamut, have buyers, have listings. But I will say that our main focus is still the listings because it just works for us. And I think what we do differently with listings is we have something in Midwood out in Brooklyn for $200,000. We have something in Chelsea for $8 million. So it just runs the gamut. We're not afraid to take on anything that we think we can sell. We don't take on anything that we don't think we can sell. And then the other thing we truly focus on is how do we make this property look the best it can? So we do a lot of our own staging or styling or designing. And we add that as, you know, as if we get the listing, we bring this to you complimentary. So that's drastically improved our business and ourselves. I mean, you can sort of look at some of the listings that were with other brokers before, look at the photographs of what we, of the listings that, we, that we've taken off from them and see the difference in what we just the slight tweaks we were able to do and those listings nine times out of ten have sold so John, i would you, say yeah are you seeing in this market like i we we always stage our listings too but i i, I you got to really price chop it i feel like are you are you seeing your like unless you're ahead above every other listing in the market i feel like it's really hard to get traction right now what do you think well, I do think it's hard to get traction. So you want to make the property look the best it can and pricing's everything always. So we don't take a listing that's overpriced. If it's, we don't mind being the second, third, even fourth broker, if we can get the price right and it matters. So, you know, pricing's everything. So one of, one of Martin's really big things is he's not going to take a listing that he feels is overpriced or that the market isn't going to support that price. So that's a, that's a great point. And Greg, I'm going to let you answer this is, is no one wants to take an overpriced listing, right? But sometimes you take a listing because you want to continue the relationship and you're afraid someone's going to step in. How do we navigate that, Greg? How, how do we navigate this in this time? I mean, there's never really been a greater market in my career than the current one to handle, you know, unreasonable clients with, you know, unreasonable expectations. I mean, the, the media is doing it perfectly for us. We don't have to do anything. Any seller that thinks they have leverage at the moment is living in outer space, you know? I mean, we have more data at our disposal than we could ever ask for, uh, you know, in order to ground them in reality, really. Not to put you I think I think also if, if a buyer is being unrealistic too, I mean, that, that happens as well in this market where a buyer's like, I'm gonna get 25% off, you know? Like, I think um, I assess whether or not they could be tripped away at. A lot of them can be, and if they, if I feel they can't be, then I just kind of, you know, let them go and, and, and move on. Yeah. Well, well, let me put you on the spot. I'll put you all on the spot is, um, you know, you have a long time client and no matter what, you give them all the stats, all the information, and no matter what, they're still going to overprice at 20%. What are you going to do? Do you, do you take the listing? Or, um, or do you let it go? Uh, I will, you, you can take the listing with a caveat, say, hey, look, I'll try your price for 60 days, 30 days, whatever you deem reasonable. And then at that point, we talk about lowering the price. Now we've done that. And generally speaking, that's how it works out. Okay, we, you, we, you wanna put it out at this price, we revisit this in 30 days, or if 20 people see it and we don't have offers, then we know it's overpriced and we re revisit it then. But you can take, it on with a caveat that we're going to revisit this later if it doesn't move yeah i think the truth always wins you know i mean especially in in this market it's like you let it know you let it be known exactly what your opinion is and you support it with data you can't lose you can take the you can take the listing and frankly it's not really going to be a lot of work you know i mean you're not going to get any showings i mean at the end of the day and so yeah you have to you have to pay for marketing and that's fine 
But as long as they know what your realistic perspective is, then you can't lose and you just kind of wait for them to get beaten down. And then, you know, they're beaten down perfectly and, and, and they're ready to trade, you know, eventually. And sometimes it's better to be the second agent. You know, sometimes you tell it to them straight, they don't hire you, but they'll come back because the other guy who's not telling it to them straight is not going to sell it, especially today. Totally. Absolutely. That's a great point. I agree. Um, yeah, I, I will say, and you guys all present yourselves with such confidence and you know, not, a, not all of us have that. We all have a moment of weakness. You know, rely on the, the facts, rely on the information and go in there. You have to be willing to lose it to win. I've always said, I used to say that to myself. You have to be willing to lose it to win. Uh, and, and when you do, things start to happen. Um, okay. Next question, and and oh, Alex. By the way, like yeah. when you are when you are willing to lose, I mean that that actually resonates with me for for uh, sellers that I'm actually working with right now, because when you're willing to lose it, even in the moment, uh, you know they're I feel like they're they're far more respectful of you, uh, and and they'll listen to what you have to say. And if you're really willing to walk away, then you you're in like a win win situation. You know, absolutely. absolutely. Um, I'm going to bring up, uh, I don't know if it's controversial, but it's, uh, it, I'm curious to see where you guys all stand on it. Premier agent leads. Do you guys pay for them? Do you feel that it's worth it? Is it more worth it just to work your sphere of influence? What are your thoughts? Uh, I think, I think that, look, until the industry stands up to street easy, it is, it's a reality and you have to play with it. If, if, if there's a way of limiting street easies, you know, uh, influence over our industry for it. But until, you know, the industry steps up and actually to makes those steps as an industry, leave money on the table, particularly when they're calling me to do a deal with me. Um, Wesley, the, 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 it like, in, sorry, it sounds like you guys uh, participate this and it, it obviously isn't for everyone. What is the conversion? How is it different speaking to a cold lead than it is to, you know, I know this is an obvious question. I just want to hear the answer uh, than, than a referral. Like, what do you have to do different? First, or, obviously, obviously, a, obviously, a referral is going to be a much better situation and we focus our business on those on those people, sure. um, you know, the, the majority of people that come through Street Easy, I, I, I do not work with for right. whatever reason. Um, sure. So, you, you know, because I have to maximize my time. I, can, I mean, we, we would get a lot of calls from Street Easy, but most of them are not people that are going to be an effective use of my time. Hold um, on, can I, take a, can I take a minute while I have all these people on this phone? This Street Easy program is illegal. I do not understand how it works. It's steering. It, there's so many things that are wrong with it. Clients call, people are calling random brokers. They're, it's Saturday night. They don't really want to deal with them. So the lead never gets to the person that they were trying to call. It's terrible for the client. It is the worst thing ever. Somebody should do something about it. But since I'm the little guy, we're doing, we're doing, we're doing a deal or two a month on this program. Yeah, I, I agree with Jordan. It, it, it is the most unethical, ridiculous, insane program. And I don't really have a problem with, you know, uh, somebody choosing to work with an expert, but the issue is the lack of transparency. I mean, it, 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 there is a total lack of transparency and disclosure about who the people are contacting. It and is like bait said, like, and switch. It's a complete and disservice switch. to the uh, to the the thing I have the biggest issue with is it's a total disservice to the seller. It's a disservice to the seller. The, the seller is the reason they have the listing on the website in the first place, and the seller has no idea who's answering the inquiries for their apartment. And very often those inquiries go unanswered, and sometimes I get very frustrated buyer calls and saying, I contacted you four times. Like, why aren't you getting back to me? I'm like, I have no idea because I haven't heard from you until this very moment. But I'm, you know, I'm actually finding that uh, these days I'm getting a lot more direct uh, buyers contacting me through Street Easy, learning how to circumvent the program than I was in the, in the very beginning. I think buyers are catching on to it. 
And, you know, our team, uh, you know, we, in the beginning, we did it as uh, to make up for the business we were losing from it. So we participated in it, but um, I think like three months ago, I turned off all the leads because I wanted to be able to service those leads and we were just getting uh, too many, uh, you know, too many inquiries on our own listings to be able to service the other ones. But I, I think that everyone needs to know that you can buy that space next to your listings. So it's also extortion on top of steering Absolutely. and bait and switch. Completely but now different. we find that we're we, we need to buy that space to protect our clients from you know, this bait and switch nonsense. The truth is, until there's a better option than Street Easy, Street Easy is going to dictate how we have to have to uh, yeah. you know operate because it's their it's their company, right? So until we as agents and companies, you know, figure out a better situation, you know, we're going to have to we're all going to have to deal with Street Easy. Unfortunately, I think that there's multiple opportunities that 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 the powers that be within our industry could have flipped the switch a little bit and for whatever reason they haven't and uh you know um until they do which i would be all for by the way um we're we're just gonna have to play the game that street easy is making us play unfortunately so alex to answer your question we are doing it we're using it um we're doing about but we don't particularly like doing it it's not yeah. like i would we're rather doing, not do it you know, like I, I, I knew this was a hot button, but that's okay. But, I, 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 we have good agents here, and um, I, I think, Wesley, you made a very good point. Um, look, there are leads out there, and it's your choice. You're independent contractors. Um, should you want to pay for it, you can. I think the, the main point was, is, as, and, and Lauren, I'm curious, because you said mostly about referral businesses. When I was an agent, I steered away from it and because I even tried it, but it just was not my personality. I had a real difficult time uh, converting people that thought I was the listing agent or something like that. So yeah, but, I've, I've never used Premier Agent, and I think similarly, I don't. It doesn't feel comfortable or natural to me personally. I rather invest that what one hundred, two hundred dollars on dinner or an experience with my clients, um, or a gift, or um, spending time and take them out somewhere. I mean. Not right now, but um, that, that's the way I rather spend my time and money. And, you know, we all have limited energy and I rather do it towards someone that I already have a, a, a relationship or introduction to than something off the internet, like a, a blind lead. So. All right. But we, but, um, so I, I'm the bad guy now. So I'll take <laughs> You're the not the bad guy. I'll take the other side of it. So we, I am, I am good at that. Like I can get, but I, we t I tell them the truth up front. I, you know, I tell them, I tell them, listen, I'm not the, I'm, I, I've done a lot of big deals in this building. I know this building well. I can help guide you through the process. I can also help you with other units. So we we're, we're honest up front, but, but it's, uh, it's definitely bad for the sellers. We're do, but I would recommend it to everybody though, if you're going to play the game, because we're doing a deal or two a month, you know, on the program. Uh, you know, you know, a, 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 a while ago, this was years and years ago. Um, I was at a Tom Ferry, you know, sales meeting, one of those free things, you go meet Tom Ferry, yada, yada. And he was sitting there saying, you know, there was some sort of, uh, there was some sort of um, poll that rated real estate agents as the second worst customer service industry in the country or something like that. And he made this proclamation, we need to do better guys. And I raised my hand, I was like, you guys don't do any better keep doing terribly because it makes me stand out as a good agent. When people talk to you, you do terribly like a used car salesperson. And then I get on the phone with them and they, and I'm a breath of fresh air. And the street easy program is kind of like that because there's a lot of terrible, terrible brokers who have no idea what they're doing, who are bait and switch brokers who are, are unethical on that program. And when somebody gets on and they speak to somebody who actually is professional and understands the market, you stand out and, and, and it's easy for me at least to kind of convert that person. Yeah, I, I converted a couple of those leads in the beginning and I think the key to converting them is being as transparent as you possibly can be to earn their trust, you know? And if you're doing that, then they're like, oh, thank you so much for being honest with you. I wanna work with you. I actually, you know, hate to say it, don't tell street easy, but I used to tell the, the buyers that I spoke to how much I hated the program, you know? <laughs> 
um, you know, because of, because of the lack of transparency. And they love that, you know, they, they love that I hated the program. So, you know, but I, I, I still hate the program. All right, I'm gonna shift <laughs> gears a little. And Alex, we gotta we're, move along. we're gonna do some rapid fire questions here. Uh, and then Rory's gonna join us at 2.50. So um, 10 seconds or less. Uh, and I'll, weakest neighborhood you, you think, Sean? Uh, Upper, East Upper East Side. Upper East Side, Jordan. Yes. Midtown East. Midtown East, Wesley. Financial District. Financial District, Lauren. Upper East Side. Upper East Side, Greg. I, as well, was gonna say the Upper East Side. Oh Enjoy. my God, poor Upper East Side. Hey, I live there, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I am offended. No, one, I one, better, I one better, one better on Upper East Side. I will say this, both the Upper East Side and Midtown East have a zillion deals right now. That, that's where the most deals are on the Upper East Side. So, so I don't, I agree with the financial district. I think the financial district is, is in for a world of hurt. There's a lot of, there's a lot of product and there's nobody there. All right, converse. And, and honestly, the financial district was a, was a, was a tough sell before this. Yeah. Yeah. All right, conversely, the strongest neighborhood. Sean, any great, any great townhouse neighborhood in Brooklyn. Brooklyn's hot. Yes. Greg. Uh, I, sorry, I have to agree as well. We, our team does a lot of work in Brooklyn and, and we're not having any trouble here at all. Leslie. Hands down, any affordable townhouse in Brooklyn. Hands down. It's wow. a hot, it's the only hot category in all of New York City as far as I'm concerned. Lauren. Brooklyn. Can't okay. pinpoint one. Yeah. Come on, give me Island. <laughs> Park Slope, Park Slope, townhouse, cheap. Very nice. All right. Um, a little fun one for you. When we uh, fully reopen, what restaurant are you looking forward to going back into? Jordan. Oh man, no! Don't even. I don't know. Right, come back to you, Lauren. Uh, honestly, I miss sitting at a bar. It could be any restaurant at this point. <laughs> all right. All right, Sean. Oh, I'm going to say Tartines in the Village. Oh, little French tartines. I love Tartines. Wesley. Any bar. <laughs> <laughs> Any bar. <laughs> oh, man. I don't know. I'm just going to say the Strip House. Um, just just right. because why not? You know, yeah. I love it there. Very nice. Sounds like we all need a drink. All right. <laughs> uh, uh, here's a different question for you. What was an unexpected positive outcome that happened for you guys six months, during the last six months? Could be personal, could be business, keep it short. Uh, Lauren. I think the first couple of months, it gave us actually a time to, even though it was super stressful, to pause and take time off in a way, in a yeah. way that we could never before and kind of reevaluate everything. Yeah. And, and no, I like it, that. To, I like. To, to, to do that collectively, all at the same time is definitely a gift. I like that answer. Sean. Uh, I'm going to say I grew, I grew closer to Martin. Like that time we had just being at home, like we yeah. truly grew closer together. That's nice. That's nice. Greg. I, I've been talking a lot about this this summer, about um, how this time, I, I feel like obviously, you know, we're, we're very unlucky with, with, with the hand we've been dealt this year in 2020, but... I actually feel like we, we are also very lucky to have experienced this perspective, um, which we never would have had before and never dreamed we would have. And that relates all that, that relates to my personal life in addition to um, you know my business life. Very nice. Wes? You know, um, I would say it's two things. Um, you know, we've been very successful this year. Obviously, in March, it didn't really look like that's the way it was going to go, but it's the way it went. And to be able to do that type of business during this time and at the same time spend all the time I have with my family um, has been really amazing, honestly. Uh, you know, like, I know 2020 has been difficult for a lot of people, so that, 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 that yeah. I'm sensitive to that. But personally, for me, it's been, uh, you know... It's been pretty wonderful, honestly, because I, I don't get to spend as much time as I want with my son and my wife. And so it, it's been, you know, to not have to like, you know, spend time with your family at the cost of your business is just a blessing. Got it. Jordan. I never thought I would finish Netflix, but I did it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I would have thought. <laughs> 
Okay, I, I have like a guilty pleasure confession. I can't believe I'm watching it, but I'm going to say it's really good. Cobra Kai. Oh, oh so god. good. No, oh way. my god, it's so good. Uh, okay. And, and I spent, hold on, I spent a lot of time with my son and that was awesome too. So, okay. <laughs> sounds good, sounds good. All right, I'm going to put you guys on the spot, get your crystal balls out. 2021, prices up or down? Sean. I'm going to say prices will be very similar to what they are now. Okay. Uh, Greg. Oh, God, that is way too difficult of a question to answer. But if, I'm going to say up just to be positive, but maybe towards <laughs> the end of the year. <laughs> Wes. I think it's going to be flat because, you know, coming out of the coronavirus, I think that people are going to really be looking at who the next mayor is in New York City and what's going on with the, the – um, what's going on with taxes, what's going on with uh, the, the politicians that seem hell-bent at destroying the city. Lauren? I think it actually might be going down. Okay. Because <laughs> um, uh, we'll have new comps, right? And a lot of them will be lower than what they were a year ago. And Jordan? Yeah, I think we're going to keep dropping until the end of the year, and then it's at best it's flat. But it's going to depend on a lot of the fallout that the, the, the whole country faces because of everything that happens, you know, who goes bankrupt, who, you know, what developers fall apart, you know, there might be a flood of inventory. Great, great. All right, last question, and then Rory will probably join us. You just hired a new broker on your team. What's the one bit of advice you need to give them that's, you know, will be, make them successful? Run! <laughs> <laughs> Get on the phone. Who said that? Oh, Greg, Greg, get on the phone. All right, Sean. I would say people, people in the industry want to feel taken care of. So just be mindful to take care of people. And it's, that's sort of one of the best things you can do is to really make people feel taken care of. People often don't remember what you say, but they remember how you make them feel. So I think it's extremely important to take care of people and make them feel good. Yeah. Lauren? Yeah, kind of co-tailing on that. It's uh, being present when you're with your clients, whether it's in person or on the phone. Awesome. Gi sure. giving, giving, giving them your time. Jordan. I think, I think, the, I think they just got to grind it out. I think you just got to get on the phone every day and you got to be disciplined and give yourself a real routine and follow that routine. And there are no, you really have to be disciplined with yourself. Like you're going to the gym or you're on a diet or whatever it is. And yeah. if you do that, you will, you're going to, you're going to succeed. Awesome. Wesley, you get the last word. Um, I think people getting into this industry, I've heard a lot of times people say, well, I have a lot of friends and I have a network and they're all going to list with me. And um, I, I would say your friends are not going to make your business because you're still selling a very expensive asset. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't trust a million dollars to somebody who just got into the business. So you have to fit, you have to really kind of see this as a opportunity, opportunity to learn. And as Jordan said, you got to grind it out. You got to make new friends and expand your social, your, uh, your sphere of influence. Uh, otherwise you're gonna be dead in your wa in the water because friends don't make a business. All right. Well, guys, you guys were incredible. This was uh, thank you so much for sharing. Uh, lots of great information, lots of real information, lots of real feedback. I hope and ever, everyone on the call uh, appreciated. I certainly did, and I learned a lot just from listening to you guys. Um, we have uh, Alex, but, but, but before yeah. we go, can I be controversial and have the last three words? <laughs> you certainly may. <laughs> Only because you have that incredible <laughs> suit on. Oh, and we're, and we're not hopping off the call. Rory's going to be chatting with us for 10 minutes, but I just, we're, we're wrapping up this. Okay. But, okay. But go ahead, Sean. Last three words. Say her name. Well said. Well said. Brianna. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Rory, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alex. Um, and thank you everyone for letting me jump on here uh, and, and hijack uh, the end of this call. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry I couldn't, uh, couldn't make it a different part of it. I actually really enjoyed some of the things I just heard. I love the idea of like, your friends won't make your business. That's such a, 
that's such an interesting point. I, I talk to so many people who want to get into this business and want to join our company who are new to the industry. And I'm oftentimes, I'm sorry, we don't hire new agents. And they're like, yeah, but I have so many friends. I have so many friends. I was like, I know a lot of people have a lot of friends. Like, you know, uh, so that, 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 that's, that is a really interesting point. Um, I want to share something with, with this group and get your feedback. Um, and I think the easiest way to get your feedback is I'm going to share something with you and present it. And I'd love for those of you who have a moment to email me, you know, as soon as you hop off this call with feedback and ideas on, on what I'm going to share with you. Um, so many of you, or maybe some of you have seen in the past, the compass flywheel. Um, and for those of you who haven't, I'm going to share my screen here, uh, to show you what this is. Um, a flywheel is essentially a visual representation of what makes a business uh, hum. What, what is that business's unique strategy and, and capability that makes that business uh, able to outcompete its competitors? Um, and our, this was our initial compass flywheel that we came up with about a year and a half ago. And I won't even spend much time on it because it's really confusing and it's not obvious and it's not direct. I mean, you look at it, it kind of looks like an atom in the middle with, you know, all the protons rotating around. You got inventory, buyer traffic, sellers, agents, software. It's just like, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot going on there. Right. But essentially what a flywheel does is it says, Hey, this is how this company has a unique value proposition relative to others. And this is what makes it successful. Right? Amazon's flywheel is really obvious. The more merchants they get on there, the more products they have on their site, the more of us will go on and search for those products. So that's the more traffic they have, which is more transactions. And that means more merchants want to be there because they have more traffic. And then if there are more merchants, there's more products. And that just goes and goes and goes. And, and, and that's why they've built such a successful business. And so we had an offsite on Monday uh, with the senior leadership team. And one of the topics among a host of topics was about how we can restructure our flywheel to make it something that's really obvious and use it as a mechanism to drive clarity among our employees on what we are doing, what we're building, and why it is so important to be hyper-focused on delivering value for agents. And also for our agents to have a sense of what we're doing and why we're building for them and why we're hyper-focused on it. And we came up with essentially a new structure of that flywheel. And what I want to do is share this with you, uh, go through it quickly and have you guys just email me thoughts and feedback on this idea. What I'm going to share, the language, the actual words we're using really matter. I want us to have perfect language around this. I want it to be so obvious that any agent can be asked, like, what makes Compass unique? What's the strategy of Compass? You know, what 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 is what is it that you're doing and i want it to just be so simple just like our mission statement is everyone finding their place in the world right like everyone knows that it's pretty straightforward and direct and helps drive a lot of clarity and so let me see if i can pull this up here so this is a live sketch this was actually a sketch taken from the offsite so this is kind of how how this thing goes the first is invest in platform innovation now that that is what that means is Invest in technology, invest in tools, invest in programs, human support, culture. That is every tool and thing that we give to agents to help them grow their businesses, save time, make more money, be successful. Technology is a big piece of it, but it's also marketing and human support, culture, Compass Concierge, Bridge Loans. I mean, you know, the list goes on and on. And if we do that, that will help agents grow their client base and save time. And when I've been, I've shared this with a couple of folks so far, and some people have said, actually, it's probably give me more time. I wouldn't really say save time. I've had some people say, yeah, grow client base makes sense. But actually, I think of it as like my sphere of influence. You know, if I had more people in my sphere, um, you know, if I had more referrals, you know, so it's if you invest in these things, it will help you do those two things. It'll help you grow your business and save time. Now, if we help agents grow their businesses and save time, then you will grow your business. You'll make more money, right? And so if you make more money and you're successful, that means that you'll want to be a compass and others like yourselves will want to be a compass. And then the more folks that come to compass, that means there's more money that can be invested in creating value to help you grow your client base and save time. And now you can see how that wheel goes. 
Now, the reason why we have this opportunity and no one else has is because to get these things started in a company, it takes a lot of money, a lot of people, and a lot of time. And in our case, we had about seven years, you know, uh, 18,000 agents and 2,000 employees, and about a billion and a half dollars to get this whole thing started. But once you get it started, if you continue to invest in it, it doesn't stop. And so I share this with all of you because the way I envision this is I want this to be the sort of thing that Robert shares at an all company meeting and every agent sees it and says, got it. I know that the company is singularly focused on investing in helping me grow. I know that will translate to helping me make more money. And therefore that'll make me want to be a compass and my colleagues will want to be a compass. And I want agents to know that I want them to understand it. And I also want it to help explain and clarify why we continue to grow, right? I've had a lot of agents who've said to me, like, why do we keep expanding? Why do we keep growing? Um, this is exactly why, right? We have to feed the fuel to that, to that engine. So I, I'm sharing that with this group. And if you guys had a couple minutes and you could just share ideas on what are the right words to use here, right? If the sentiment I'm going for is we want to invest in tools to help you, we want those tools to help you get more clients and have more time. Therefore, that will help you make more money. And that will in turn attract, and I use the word quality here because this is really important. We want to make sure that it's very clear that the bar we want to continue to hold for this company is high. And we don't want every agent. This is not meant to be a company where every agent works at Compass. And so we're, I'm trying to find the right adjective and the right words to come up with what can sort of codify that, that concept. Quality agents, productive agents, top-notch, whatever it is. And so to the extent that any of you have any feedback on what that language could be, it would be incredibly helpful. Um, so that's what I wanted to share. Uh, thank you, uh, Alex, uh, for letting me jump on. Let me unmute myself. Absolutely. That's great. Um, so anyone on the call, please share your feedback with Rory. Again, thanks hosts, uh, agents extraordinaire for sharing all your insights. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. looks like it's going to be a nice warm weekend, probably the last warm weekend of our summer fall. So enjoy that. And uh, we'll see you guys all very soon.